Vettel kicks off silly season. Is this the end for Ricardo? Meanwhile, at the Alpine HQ meeting. Uh, Otimar, uh, I think I think I go to Aston Martin. Yeah, mate, while you're in it there, I think I might go to McLaren. And the obscure fucking pricks move! And I'll execute every motherfucking last one of you! Welcome to the Late Night Race Review. Welcome back to episode 19 of the Late Night Race Review. I hope everyone is surviving the F1 summer break. I'm Dave Jericho, and with me as always is Owen Scott and Nazero Gonzalez. It was just over a week ago we learned that Sebastian Vettel had joined social media to the excitement of F1 fans everywhere. Then, three hours later, Vettel announced he was retiring from Formula 1. And so began silly season. So before we dive into that, though, we can't start the podcast without thanking all you fine people for tuning in each week. If you haven't already, hit that follow and subscribe button and join us each week for more race reviews and F1 discussion. Uh, now, with that, all that out of the way, Scotty, how are you surviving the F1 summer break? I'm good. Yeah, my plan is just to purely sleep until the F1 comes back again. I wake up briefly to do these podcasts and then I go back to sleep again. Yeah, yeah you haven't, you haven't uh, decided to dip the toe into the Premier League? Uh, yeah, in fairness, I have. Yeah, yeah, I oh, look, <laughs> yeah, I had to out you right away on the yeah, yeah, let's not start talking about soccer. <laughs> yeah, 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 all right, fair enough, fair enough. All right, Isidro, what about yourself? How are you? How are you surviving? Uh, having fun watching this uh soap opera that has been <laughs> fun for the past two weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, I thought you were about to say like, like, Actual home and away opera, or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Uh, well, look, I think the, the 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 only right place to kick off today is going to be with the retirement of Sebastian Vettel. Four-time world driver champion, 53 race wins, 122 podiums, 57 pole positions, was the youngest driver to score world championship, point, youngest driver to win an F1 race, youngest driver to get pole position, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> so, just some of the many achievements that decorate his long F1 career, but the retirement wouldn't have come as a surprise to anyone. I mean, I think we all thought that it might have come at the end of his time with Form uh, with Ferrari, should I say. But I think maybe the difference between it coming at the end of Ferrari versus now, it feels a little bit more natural now that he's kind of progressing to maybe or evolving to the next stage of his career or whatever he might want to do in life. Whereas at Ferrari, you could tell he was, you know, we all thought he was going to maybe retire because things got toxic in Ferrari. It just, he wasn't enjoying his racing. So looking at this from a, a pure racing perspective, Scotty, and keeping the off-track reasons for his retirement out of it, do you think he lost the edge in F1 and now is the right time for him to bow out? Or do you think maybe he should have pushed harder for a seat in a better car? I mean, he is six years younger than Alonso, and Horner was only interviewed not too long ago saying that they did actually consider Vettel before they went with Perez. I, I mean, we all would have loved to have seen Vettel continue on and try to try to push for um a better car than um than the aston martin but you can see this season that just it isn't there for him you can't you can't take the off track stuff out of the equation because that's that's you can see that's highly influencing what's been going on this season he's the 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 big thing in his announcement was about time away from his family and that was the big emphasis and you can see it can't help but affect him and uh, that that's what we've been seeing on the track i think for for the most part this year his heart isn't in it and i think it is time to go if it, if he's not going to be able to commit to it fully um then i think it's yeah it's time it's a shame as well because we all would have loved to have seen him push on again and have another go at um at a few race wins and maybe a title but um it it, it was not to be unfortunately yeah, it would have been nice to, as an F1 fan, it would have been nice to see him bow out with a, not even a competitive car in in that sense, but like you say, something that was maybe going to see him competing for a podium mm -hmm. uh, more regular than than obviously what uh, he has to deal with at Aston Martin, unfortunately. So yeah, it is a bit of a sad end. But um, I mean, we were reading out a few of his stats earlier and, and you touched on it there, Scotty, as well. Like it's it's pretty clear that he, he was bringing more as well to, to Formula One than just you know the, the the stats uh he's involved quite a lot over the over his career he went from that sort of young and slightly clumsy driver when he when he first came into the sport became that ruthless driver we knew when he reached red bull you know gave 
no inch on the track and and that uh, sort of single fing- finger uh, celebration that everyone either loved it or hated it um cared not for team orders as we knew with the whole multi 21 scenario with Mark Weber um, and then he went on through to his time then at Ferrari where he tried to achieve his his childhood dream which was to sort of emulate Michael Schumacher to some degree or at least some sort of success with Ferrari and then unfortunately as we and we mentioned the final stages of his career then at Aston Martin he still made the the most of it though he became a mentor to younger drivers Mick Schumacher obviously the most notable and of course then using the F1 platform for his environmental work and stuff like that so i mean what is either when you look back on Vettel's career is there a moment or a phase of his career that you look back at being defining for him um as an F1 driver or just as part of the F1 sport uh, there's a lot of moments, but uh, one that I can say it's uh, it's a good one that demonstrate Vettel uh, capacity as a driver and as a person is the the race in Abu Dhabi in 2012. He started mm-hmm. from the pit lane. He had to go back because uh, the front wing was damaged. Uh, then he has an is- an incident with Daniel Ricciardo damaged the wing again, back to the pit, and he was on P21, and he was able to finish in P3 in that uh, in that race. And I think that says a lot from a driver. Absolutely. He could just, uh, just quit or stop fighting, but the, from P21, 18 positions, I think uh, that said a lot. Yeah, and it's it, it's rare. You're right. You see a lot of drivers that, or not a lot, but you see a, a good few drivers in that sort of position where all of a sudden they're not making their way through the pack and you can sort of tell they, they, they've they given up and they've resigned the, to the fact that they're going to be, you know, sort of finishing the race outside the point. Um, but what about yourself, Scotty? Like, is there any moment in Vettel's career that you would see as defining or maybe just a, a favorite moment like like Isidro, like Isidro had there, a favorite moment from his career? I, I think looking at, um, again, I, I came into, um, into F1 properly, I think, in, in around that uh, Ferrari phase of, of Vettel's career. Um, oh, so these are the, the back in the day moments for you now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have to go back and look at YouTube clips for this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think that that obviously the Red Bull phase, you know, those those four titles is yeah. that that's what defines his career. When looking back on it, we all would have hoped that coming into Ferrari with the whole Mick Schumacher thing, being another German driver, that he was going to he was going to do it there as well. But yeah. it's it's got to be that that Red Bull phase, those those four world titles. Yeah, it it is it is sad to say, well not sad, but it's it's unfortunate that he didn't have the success with Ferrari. And just before we move on to that, and and I know we're not really going to be we're not diving into the whole Ferrari disaster, but the like Sebastian Vettel, like the 2016, I think even maybe the 2017, those seasons were riddled with like they're almost a replica of what Charles Leclerc is having at the moment with uh, Ferrari. There's a combination of driver error and then absolutely horrific strategy calls from the from the pit lane you're like that's six years ago and we're now in 2022 and we're still uh, we're still seeing the same from ferrari but um but anyway sorry i i digress <laughs> let's not do a ferrari let's, thing again let's let, let's not jump on that one just yet um so i don't know do we do we expect to see it like i saw an article there um and and some quotes from uh, stefano the ceo of formula <laughs> one where he had a did I hear a drum roll? No, something just <laughs> dropped on this desk. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I thought there was a drum roll coming for this one. Bloody <laughs> hell, don't hype it up that much. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But there was um yeah, I saw I saw an article uh with Stefano and he was just saying that now this could be just a bit of hype from you know media trying to trying to get squeeze every last ounce out of a an hour or out of a conversation. But he was basically saying there was a, just a little quote here saying Sebastian will always be associated with F1. And of course, we want that connection to remain close in the future. If he is interested in becoming part of our system and the approaches fit together, I would, of course, welcome him here. Um, now, I know the reports that are coming out saying, oh, we could see Vettel back in 2023 under a different role. Like, that's not happened. Like you said earlier, his main reason for is to step back and spend some time with the family um, and look at some of his other passions. But... Later on in down the line, Scotty, do you think maybe he might be interested in a, a, a different role within Formula One and be part of the sport? Or is it like, you know, 
you've quit a job and the last thing you want to do is go back to that office again. Yeah, I, like I, I, with, with F1, he's been with a few different teams um, over his career. So I don't think it's quite the same if you go back and, and work within the F1. It's, you're not going back to directly just to, to one team. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's the type of thing, F1, that once it gets under your skin, I'd say it's very, very hard to let that go. So I do see... You know, we see like the cool tards and and um, the hills and everyone coming back and working with Sky. There, there will be a role for him somewhere. He will be back. We're not seeing the last of Sebastian Vettel around F one. Whether it it's from uh, some sort of an environmental uh, aspect and how the sport impacts the environment, I think that'd be a cool um, as an advisor or something yeah, like something that. Something like that. Yeah. Some sort of a role within uh, environmental studies around uh, F one and the impact mm-hmm. of F one, possibly. Um, I think that'd be a cool because that's obviously that's the way that he's going to be going now. He's going to be taking up a lot of these causes and spearheading them. Yeah. So possibly something there, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 a good shout. Actually, that's something I didn't actually think about. Um, and what about yourself, Isidro? Uh, what's your thoughts? Do you, do you think we could see him come back in the future, or time to move on? Uh, I think he'll be away maybe for two or three years, but he'll then come back as. Uh... Scotty was saying about the environment. I mean, F1 has been trying to carbon zero 2030. Mm. And uh, I'll not I'll not be surprised if Vettel will not be part of that initiative for the for 2025 20, or 26 just to help them. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Yeah, well, that's I mean, look, we'll certainly be interested and in see what comes next for Vettel. Um, but what <laughs> he hasn't left the sport without causing a ruckus anyway because certainly the his his retirement announcement is sort of what kicked off the whole silly season for us and now we have the job of picking apart this this <laughs> this absolute mess yeah. um so i mean it was actually i mean let, let's jump in first to uh, for alonso to aston martin um so it was actually aston martin who were pushing Vettel to make the call early and Clearly, we obviously know what Vettel's answer was at that point. Um, but then Alonso decided to jump from Alpine to join Aston Martin. And we've, whole, we've heard a whole host of reasons behind why he's made this move. We've heard that he wasn't offered a multi-year deal, a strained relationship with Otmar, um, or just perhaps the Aston project is you know looking more enticing in 2023. I think they've got a bit of a be- bigger uh, spend going on. They've got new factories being built, all, all kinds of things like this. But Isidro, like, what's your thoughts on this move and also the manner in which it happened? Obviously, we had Alpine stating that they had no idea Alonso was even leaving until Aston Martin released the press statement. Yeah, the, this all, the, it was a big mess from Alpine. We've, they weren't expecting that move from Alonso, but the fact they then rushed to get the, try to say that Oscar Piastri was joining them for mm. 2023. And then uh, he denied that that didn't help the, that position, but the fact that they they knew the position that uh, Alonso had, and if if they truly wanted, they should have given the contract sooner than just uh, let the the season go this far without telling me anything. I mean, the, he wanted to race, wanted to be sure he was on for more t- two years, I think. Yeah, and uh, they just wouldn't just say, "Yeah, come uh, stay with us." Well, I and, think it... uh, Aston Martin move the fact they are investing more. I think that uh, it was uh, an important uh, uh, objective that mm-hmm. helped uh, Alonso say, "Yeah, I think Aston Martin should be good for the next two years." That they gave him that. Uh, yeah, that but, time, but and that's just it. The, there was a bit of. <laughs> If Alpine really wanted him there, I mean, sort of don't just tow him along with, you know, offering one year to, you know, offer him the two years, give him what he's looking for if he means that much. But they were sort of looking for their cake and eating it too with, you know, with Piastri and stuff like that, which we'll jump into now as well. Like we had, I mean, they, I, I felt they fell asleep at the wheel a little bit here with Alonso moving on, which they knew nothing about, you know, Um then it got even more bizarre when they announced Piastri was signed up to replace Alonso. And then, of course, the internet flooded with congratulations for Piastri. Um, and similar to Vettel, only a few hours later, we we, we got uh, we got drastically corrected. 
Uh, and Piastri said that not only was this not true, but he doubled down on that saying that I won't be driving for Alpine in 2023. Um, and obviously now that's come about from possibly a move to McLaren or what looks like a certainty of a move to McLaren. But uh, that's not actually as clear cut as it's going to be because Piastri is still in contract with Alpine. Daniel Ricciardo still has a contract with McLaren until 2023. And the current news is that McLaren are working on an exit deal for Daniel so they can terminate his contract earlier. However, on the other hand, like Alpine are pretty butthurt about what's gone on with all this. They may not be inclined to either release, either loan Piastri out to McLaren because the options are Piastri's in, he's in contract with, with Alpine, but they have an option to loan him out for 2023. Now, the language that uh, that that Piastri has used in his in that Twitter statement says to me that Alpine are probably maybe a little bit more or a little less inclined to work with him on this. So, Scotty, what do you what do you make of the manner in which sort of Piastri handled that situation to start with? Um, should he really be pouring? I mean, he's 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 sort of walking the bridge from from Alpine to McLaren and dragging a petrol can behind him, like. And let's not forget, like he is legally in contract with Alpine. So, I mean, Otmar's coming out saying like he expected more loyalty. He, he's, you know, he he went in deep. Actually, just before I ask you to for your for your response on this, actually, let me just give you the statement actually for our, a little bit of a, a quote here from um, Otmar. He says, "We have a contract with Piastri, which he signed in November." We have spoken to our lawyers and they have told us that this is a binding contract. So part of that contract allows us to put Oscar in one of our cars in 2023, which is the reason we issued the press release, obviously the one that we knew saying that he was driving for Alpine next year. There is also an option for 2024 and the possibility for us to loan the driver to another team. We wanted Fernando with us for one more year and then loan out Oscar for 2023. I've always said in all my press conferences that Piastri would be in Formula One in 2023. And it is because I knew he could either be in one of our cars or loaned out if Fernando stayed. So like I said, there's a bit of, they wanted their cake and eating it too. They wanted Alonso to stay, but only on a one year contract, wouldn't give him anything out and just have Piastri hanging around in the paddock somewhere if there was no other drive available to loan him out anywhere. Yeah. So like, What's your thoughts on how he handled it, first of all? And then also, are, you, are Alpine right to be annoyed with what's happened? Um, well, there's a, there's a few things here. I, I, I think he here. reacted how... Yeah, here we go. Um, I think he reacted how all of us would have reacted in that, you know, if, say, if you're, you know, you're... <laughs> say, imagine you're, you're dating a woman who also has a husband. And if the, hus- or the the woman then turns around and says that, you know, I'm, well, I'm going out with this young fella now and, and the husband's standing in front of you, you're like, well, no, no, you're not. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> don't, don't throw me in the fire like that. Um, <laughs> and it's reactionary. It was reactionary from him. Now, if the, if the contract is as ironclad as Alpine seem to say mm-hmm. or seem to think, then he's in trouble. There Big will time. be trouble here. And you, you, they're not going to loan him out to McLaren. They will dig their heels in. Um, Absolutely, because they are... especially well, especially as their rivals in the constructors. Exactly. I mean, um, McLaren are only about four points, four or five points behind Alpine in the constructors. So they're not going to. Now, granted, we're talking about twenty twenty three here. Yeah. But um, yeah. Sorry, go on. I yeah I I the way this that Piastri came out with his statement would lead you to believe that. He believes that the contract isn't as ironclad as as Alpine seem to think so, and that he's he's got a deal with McLaren. That's the only thing that I can think of is that mm-hmm. he's got a deal with McLaren, all set in stone. The Alpine thing isn't as as uh, as solid as everyone thinks it is, um, because if it isn't, then he's in trouble, basically. Yeah, and I suppose with that contract with McLaren, we have to kind of talk about. Daniel in all this mess. Think of the children. Um, <laughs> so, it, you know, it wasn't long ago like we, we heard, I, I think it, it could have even have been sort of only four or five races back, maybe. Um, someone might correct me on this one. But we had sort of Daniel coming out in an interview saying he wanted to stay in F1 because we thought maybe he might retire. You know, the things just weren't going well for him. It looked like 
Vettel at Ferrari, you know, things just weren't going well. And you're just kind of went, oh, what's the best outcome for me? Or just, you know, pack your bags, and move on. But he came out and said, no, he wants to stay in F1. He's got a contract with McLaren for another season. And he was happy to, to, to stick to that contract and was delighted to stay at McLaren for next year. But performances haven't been great. Uh, they're slacking in the constructors. They're behind Alpine at the moment by, like I said, four or five points. Largely due to, I mean, if you want to be realistic about it, largely due to, to Daniel maybe not stepping up to the plate because if Daniel had stepped up um, and sort of got his share of points on in the bag, McLaren should be quite a good stretch away from where Alpine are at the moment points wise. Mm-hmm. Um, so Isidro, like, should should McLaren be looking at Piastri for twenty twenty three? Is it fair on, on on Daniel Ricciardo regardless? I mean, there's a contract there, or bring him in as a reserve driver. And you know, if they if they are able to get him released from Alpine, bring him in as a reserve driver, let Daniel's contract run down in 2023, and then you know, put him in the seat in 2024 and and make a clean transition again, assuming Piastri can get released from his Alpine contract. I think McLaren should uh, bring Piastri to a seat, assuming that everything is legal from that perspective, but keep Piastri and Norris as uh, both McLaren drivers, and let uh, Daniel just either move or retire or pay, because Daniel is not doing great in that car. Mm. And uh, it, I mean, if it's just for the money, just uh, pay the man and let him move. But then move to where Alpine might be open to get uh, Daniel, but Daniel might not be happy with that. Well, let but, me just say uh, a mes- message on when you say about moving to Alpine, because that is obviously the logical, what, what everyone would assume what was going to happen. You know, Piastri goes to McLaren, Daniel's looking for a seat, throw him in Alpine, everybody's happy. You've just done a, a, a little bit of a switch around there. But again, more articles coming out that Pierre Gasly is apparently sort of more, possibly in more pole position for that seat at Alpine than Daniel Ricciardo is. So, if Daniel does accept an exit, and again, I don't know how the legalities of things work in terms of uh, um, terminating a contract in this manner with, say, Ricardo, but if he agrees an exit deal, then, you know, he's he, and he doesn't get a drive with Alpine, then he's, he's, he's dropping back. He's just, he's dropping back in the grid, and that's going to be, a st- unfortunately, you nearly may as well retire at this stage because you're 33, you haven't had a good season in a while. You're dropping back down the grid even further. I mean, that's a sad state of affairs. Oh, Scotty, you don't agree with me, Guan? I, I don't think he can drop down the grid any further than where he is at the moment. If if we're talking about him possibly Well, going not performances. To... I mean, in terms of teams. Like oh, in terms of team, into... yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, he's down there anyway. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> head to Alpha Tauri and rightfully sit in that position where you're sitting at at the moment. It would make more sense. That's probably the more likely option, is that? But again, Alpha Tauri will want to bring through someone from the Red Bull Academy. Usually, that's what would happen in a free seat at Alpha Tauri. So, I would they? I mean, I know Daniel Ricciardo is a product of that, but would they really put a thirty-three-year-old in the sort of in the rookie's car? I mean, it's a bit of a, it's a, that's a bit of a slap in the face. I would have thought. Yeah, um, enough, yeah. But look, we, we, we will wait and see. I mean, this is going to change probably every couple of days. We're probably going to see news stories coming out that's going to contradict what was told kind of two days prior. But uh, so we'll watch this one with uh, with bated breath. But there is a another story in the paddock regarding silly season. I have to say this one, which I thought it was. I, I, I saw a first report of this and I thought it was nonsense. It was a it was a small low budget airline, uh, low budget media outlet. And uh, so I was just like, I, I I didn't buy anything into it. And now I've actually seen quotes from Gunther Steiner uh, that this is actually what's happening. So Schumacher and Haas putting pause on contract talks with Schumacher. So originally what was supposed to happen was Haas wanted to wrap up his contract talks in the summer, either before summer or during the summer break. And that was the end of it. There was nothing more said about it. But when 
Vettel left Aston Martin, and I don't know whether it was because Vettel put Mick Schumacher's name forward for the seat, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But all of a sudden, in F1 fans and the media, it looked like Schumacher might have been favoured for that seat. When that seat then got filled by Alonso, Haas then put a pause on Mick Schumacher's contract talks because they realize now it, it was a power play. They realize now that they hold all the cards. Schumacher now, if he wants to stay in F1, the reality is that potentially Haas are his only chance of doing that. And they then, so that's the reason they, they put a pause in, in, in the contract talk because basically they can give him a shitty deal or a shittier deal than he was maybe going to get. So, I don't know, dirty moves from Haas here, Scotty? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, as a business, I mean, it makes sense. Um, what, what I would love to happen now is for Alpine to come out tomorrow and be like, Mick Schumacher is driving for us in 2023. Just announce <laughs> it. Don't even talk yeah. to him. Just no, announce don't, it. <laughs> just send out a tweet. Go on. Um, because the funny thing is, any, drive, any team could actually technically do that because... He's out of contract at the end of the year. And if yep. Schumacher gets a bit fucking pain, being his bonnet about Haas basically holding his contract talks to ransom, yeah. like he can go anywhere that's there's a free seat available. No, it's it's not going to happen. I mean, he, he's not going to get the Alpine seat. But um, and we've seen this with with um, Haas before. They are pretty ruthless when it comes to like they terminated the two boys, um, Grosjean and Magnussen, I think in the yeah. same season, was it? Both of them gone. I think, yeah, well, I'm pretty sure it was, wasn't it? They replaced both of them. Yeah, they mm. did with Schumacher and and um, Mazespin. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, because so, we were uh, all complaining there was two rookies going to be sitting in the car. We thought it was absolutely mental. Yeah, so that they have previous in this. They're like they're they're pretty ruthless in their business. So like in terms of business, I'm not surprised that they've done it. Um, I think we all fall into the trap of of like oh Gunther Steiner, so he's so much fun around the track and he's like the big German yeah, yeah. dad. But really, the the team as as a business are pretty ruthless. So yeah, I'm not I'm not surprised. Bit disappointed for Schumacher now, but I would love to see another team come in now and go. Yeah, no, actually, we're we're interested in Schumacher because that would put the the run on Haas then. Well, I mean, and it leads on to to, to my next point here. But the like uh, Joe Gan Yu is out of contract this year as well. So if uh, Alfa Romeo don't renew Joe's contract. Then I mean, there's a drive available for him at Alpha. Mm. So I mean, if we look at it currently, we've got. Let me see here. The, so the teams that are currently going to have a seat open is going to be Alpine, Alpha, Haas, Alpha Tauri, and Williams. I suppose technically you could say um, McLaren, but you know, it's it's going to be open for about two seconds in the time it takes Daniel Ricciardo to get out of it and Piastri <laughs> to get into it. Yeah, yeah. So so the the, the drivers that are sort of in danger of, of of getting the axe would be Sonoda, Latifi, Joe, Schumacher. Although Schumacher, I don't think so. I think, again, I think this is just a power play in the contract negotiations. And of course, then we got Daniel Ricciardo. So I know Isidro as well. What do you think? What, what do you see happening with those drivers? Any of those drivers maybe getting dropped? Well, <laughs> Latifi, we know it's getting dropped. <laughs> but... Uh, Actually, sorry, I got I got to cut across. I'm not going to mention because I can't. Sorry, I can't remember. I, I listened to a I was listening to a podcast the other day, um, and they were <laughs> they were they were talking about uh, about Latifi, like, and they were talking about silly season, like every podcast on on the earth is is at the moment. But they were they were mentioning Latifi, and as as serious as a bullet wound, they were they were adamant that he was staying in Formula One. What? They were they were. We're we're not watching we're, we're we're not watching Formula One if they if they Axel Latifi. And I'm like, well yeah, well I can say, tell you what you're not watching next yeah. year. Was this Latifi's parents' podcast? I, I maybe his sisters or something like that. But it was uh, <laughs> I I I, just, I listened. I couldn't keep a straight face. I thought it was I thought it was great. Like I I love I love hearing fans who are so dedicated to a particular driver or team yeah. that they're just oblivious to what the I mean. It's like Daniel Ricciardo. I get it. Daniel Ricciardo has been in the sport a long time. He yeah. is technically a good driver. It's just not working for him at the moment. But they just don't. The, the reality doesn't set in with fans, and they don't realize this is a this is a business and a results based business. And if you're not bringing the results, you ain't got the business. So move on, like you know. Yeah, yeah. 
But uh, sorry, I cut across. I didn't even get uh, I didn't even get the answer from a Z draw. I was just off on one again. Um, all right. So out of those four, five drivers, we'll, we'll include Ricardo in that. So Sonoda, Latifi, uh, uh, Joe, Schumacher and Ricardo. Uh, which do you see of them? Latifi's the gone. Well, yeah, that was an easy one. That's that's yeah. like the predictions game. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see Sonoda. Maybe because um, he's a Japanese driver, AlphaTauri has a support from uh, Honda. Mm -hmm. So that might be into play about uh, dropping a, a Japanese driver. He, uh, but he's, uh, he's making uh, more points than Latifi. So that's why I'm putting the buff. Who, Tsunoda? Uh, yeah. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... No, no, no. Yes, yeah, 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 yes. Um... Uh, Joe, on the other hand, what? Well, yeah. It's a, it's a more delicate position, but then again, it's this first year, and also it might be another uh, more a political decision. It's the first time in so many years that Chinese driver is there. And... Yeah, that's a big marketing, yeah. a yeah. big marketing yeah. move if they if they decided to 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 axe it's, Joe. It's a it's a big market they would mm. uh, they would lose if they drop. And, and then the Schumacher. Market, yeah, go on. Well, he has the name behind him, so I don't think he's the brand. He, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's uh, every team wants to have Schumacher there. Yeah, yeah. and he's still young, and he's a good driver. It just needs uh, needs some time. Then Ricardo is uh, well, we don't know yet, but you know, I'll not be, su I'll go not on, be surprised if I don't see him in McLaren and, next year. Well, it's funny you should say that. I mean, just and. Just on Schumacher as well, when people... I know he, he he's there, he's in his second season now. But we were talking about Sebastian Vettel. He, like, in his first full season... Now, okay, granted, he did go on quite quickly to show his potential, whereas maybe it's arguably Mick Schumacher is not. And bearing in mind that where Vettel was showing his potential was in a car which would probably, in comparison to today, be on par with the, the Haas. But Sebastian Vettel was getting criticized because in his in his first four races, I think it was of, of, of the, that season, of his opening season, should I say, of his opening full season, um, he only finished, or he didn't finish four, four races, three out of the first four races, he crashed out or went out in the first lap of the race like i mean no other drivers i don't think has done that in in consecutive races so every driver you know can have an absolute disaster but can still go on to achieve sort of great things in in formula one so it's about seeing the potential and i do think schumacher has that potential to show um just unfortunately he's at the mercy of uh the, this this power player it has but <clears throat> Sorry, I said that with a broken voice, like I was crying or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, oh, Michael. Um, sorry. So, um, but sorry, I, see, you know, I keep cutting across here. I've got to stop doing this. Go on, what have you said? No, I was saying, you think what Diffie, you talked about crash after crash, and then he will end up winning all the race in the mid champion. <laughs> but if he suits that. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. The, the, you you got to see the potential first, and I'll be honest, <laughs> nobody sees the potential. Well, exception to the rule. Well, apart from that, uh, that that um, rival podcast and the Latifi fans. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, Latifi's defining moment of his career came at the end of last season when he crashed into a wall. He's gone, like isn't he? Like, well, that's it's not a sad case that you know your career if he is gone this year at the end of the season which let's be frank that is i don't know for certain but i know for certain yeah, um his career is going to be his f1 career is going to be known for that spin uh hours to say that crash that mm -hmm. then led to max verstappen winning the world championship so that's a yeah that's terrible that's a terrible yeah. way to go out yeah, yeah. but and then i, I want to finish then on daniel ricardo um because why not um, like, could we see a, a scenario here where he doesn't get a drive? He's without a seat next year. Yeah, it's possible. Absolutely, those those seats will fill up fast. I'd say. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, a, a lot depends on this Piastri thing and 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 McLaren. If that if if Alpine are as uh, have an ironclad contract there with um with Piastri. 
then I think you could see um, McLaren just sitting with him for another year and holding out until until Piastri's ready. Mm. Um, but yeah, but like if, if Piastri definitely goes, like if the, the McLaren seat's not an option for Daniel, mm. keeping in mind, chances are Alfa Tauri will probably want a Red Bull rookie driver. Williams will probably either, well, depending on how butthurt Alpine are, they might loan out Piastri to Williams or, you know, they'll go for a rookie driver as well. Like, where does he go? Haas, if Mick Schumacher, but Mick Schumacher is going to get a contract. Let's be real here. I mean, yeah. it, like like we said, it's the brand. He's not going to be without a contract. Mm. And Alfa Romeo, that's the only other. I mean, yeah. again, chances are Ferrari will probably want to put uh, an academy driver in in that car. Mm. So, yeah, it's hard to know. And w- would Alpine want to bring Danny Ricardo back? I mean, you don't forget that when he left Renault, he didn't really leave on the best of terms. Um, so I I don't know if they, they probably would take him back. Obviously, I, well, if, I, if he's the only one that's there, they'll probably take him. I'd say, but I'm sure they will. I mean, look, over if it's a, a case of taking either if Pierre Gasly doesn't move. Hmm. And you've got a chance of kind of, you know, and the only options are rookie drivers or Daniel Ricciardo. Let, you know, you're going to go with Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah. So, look, we'll keep an eye anyway and see how the grid shapes up and how the silly season unfolds. No doubt by the time the next podcast rolls around, there's going to be a hell of a lot of updates. But um, so we'll keep an eye on it. Let's wrap it up quick and cheerful. That's it for this week's episode. F1 might be on a summer break, but we'll be back next week where we we do plan on diving into the battle between Ferrari and Red Bull and sort of what we can see happening for the remainder of the season, assuming something absolutely catastrophic doesn't happen in silly season in the meantime, in which case that's going to get pushed back another week. So keep an eye on this one. <laughs> We're playing this by ear. Um, but as always, if you want to get in touch with your own questions, comments, or corrections, then send them on to feedback at latenightraceview.com or anywhere you find us on social media. Until next week, 